I've really been looking forward to today's topic, which is titled, If You Plant It, They Will Come. And of course, we're talking about planting native trees and plants and their impact on pollinators and songbirds. Uh, but before we get started, I want to remind everybody that's attending today of three things. Number one, if you have any questions that you would like our speaker to answer, uh, we have a chat box. You should be on your screen. Just enter your question there. And at the end of her presentation, uh, she will answer those questions live. Two, uh, this presentation is being recorded. So there's uh, some people who wanted to watch this but aren't available. Uh, we will have it available at YouTube and at the UT uh, Forestry, Fisheries, Wildlife web page. I think Christy's going to give more information or a link on that later uh, where you can look at this recording at a later date or perhaps you can share it with other people. And then lastly, uh, this presentation does qualify for one hour ISA CEU. And for those of y'all that uh, are tracking your hours, uh, your CEUs, uh, you need to have made sure that when you registered that you gave Christy your certification number. If you did not, uh, you can send that uh, to Christy or through the chat box and we'll add that to the list. You will not have to report anything to the ISA. We'll take care of that for you. So at this time, uh, I want to go ahead and introduce our speaker, who is Dr. Desiree Narango. She is a David H. Smith Conservation Fellow at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And she also works in collaboration with the U.S. Forest Service Research Station uh, in the northeastern area. Uh, now, I'm keeping that kind of short, but I do want to add a little personal comment here uh, about Desiree. Uh, many of you may be familiar with Dr. Doug Tallamy. He's become kind of a sensation lately about native plants and pollinators and so on. And he's written a book called The Nature of Oaks. And uh, as soon as that became available, I got a copy of that. And on pages 76 and 77, I believe, he's dedicated and devoted those entire two pages on research that Desiree had done. Uh, so I know, Desiree, we got a winner in you in scheduling this. You were one of uh, his students, uh, grad students, and uh, it says a lot about you and uh, also your research and your expertise. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Desiree, and the floor is yours. All right. Thank you so much, Neil. That was great. I, um, I love the introduction. I'm so glad you picked up that book. Uh, I actually haven't read it yet, <laughs> but that's something that I need to do. Um, but I hear it's wonderful. So let me share my screen. Um, hopefully this is working for you. So, uh, so again, thank you so much and thank you for this invitation. I'm always uh, really excited to get the floor and get this opportunity to share some of my work, uh, as well as my enthusiasm for some of the, uh, uh, what they call the little creatures that rule the world, um, our insects. And so, um, you know, before, before we got on to this webinar, Neil asked me to uh, share a little bit about, you know, why I do this research and like, you know, where did this come from? And I gotta say, like, when I think about it, you know, my, the reason that I ask these questions um, about plants and trees and, and what sort of biodiversity are supported uh, by them are all kind of just rooted in a curiosity about the natural world um, and really uh, an enthusiasm to help us kind of change the way that we live and um, manage the places that we live and work in ways that can be shared with biodiversity. Um, so with that, I'll just tell you, you know, as, a, as an ecologist, most of my work uh, takes place in areas where that we call human dominated, um, which if you think about it, is really basically everywhere because as people, we have dramatically and rapidly transformed the world to support a growing, um, whoops, human population. Hold on, I think I've, uh, I've got the time thing going. <laughs> 
Hold on one second. Oops. Let me just fix my slides here. Okay, we should be back here. All right, let's let's try this again. Um, all right, so like I said, so I work in human dominated landscapes, which are basically everywhere. So if we think about things like urban and agriculture, all of these land uses, we've really just changed so that we can support us as people. And, and with that comes really uh, dramatic uh, effects on habitat quality for wildlife. And at the same time, we're also just experiencing these biodiversity declines around the globe. And so, you know, our grand challenge as uh, conservationists, as uh, land managers, as members of the global public is to really ask questions of how we can then share this world with biodiversity. And so that's where I come in. So my work, my role as an ecologist is to really ask, you know, how can we do that and provide some data driven recommendations that you can then use to make uh, the decisions that you make in your everyday life. And so I work a lot in urban and in agricultural systems as well. And some of these land uses are making up pretty dramatic uh, portions of the United States. So uh, currently there's estimates that uh, for the United States, more than 60% of it is privately owned. So these are individual land managers, each making decisions based on their own needs and values. Our urban areas are only about 3% of the United States, but support 80% of our population. Um, but if we expand and not just think about urban, but think about the places that we live, like residential areas, that can be that can have estimates of 10 to 15 percent of the United States as well. And of course, much of our of our of our country is also um, um, managed as forests, but this is not protected forests in national parks or in state parks. These are unprotected or unmanaged, um, often owned by family foresters. Lots of different people are making these decisions on how to um, manage these properties. And so, you know, in most of my work, I focused a lot on urban systems because, you know, I grew up in a city and, and those are the sort of questions that, that really get me jazzed. Um, but many of the results from, from my work can also be relevant to any place where people are managing land and in particular managing plant communities. And so, um, you know, I, I, I'm showing this graph, but this, you may have already heard about uh, the insect declines that are occurring. Um, we see, we've been seeing this a lot in media. There's a lot of uh, really hope, high profile papers that are coming out that are showing that our insect populations are not doing well. We're seeing declines in abundance and diversity around the globe. And when we lose insects, we lose really important things that matter to us as people uh, because of the services that these insects provide. Things like pollination, pest control, decomposition, nutrient transfer. And of course, you know, insects do have cultural value as well. Um, you know, I remember the first time that I learned about monarch butterflies and that was kind of a transformative experience for me. Um, but when we lose these insects, um, we lose all these services that they provide as well. And so, you know, we, we've got to think about how we can then reverse these declines. Um, and David Wagner, who's a professor at University of Connecticut, um, often says that the, the global threats of insects are not just one thing. There's not just one thing that we have to fix. Um, it's called death by a thousand cuts. And so there's lots of different uh, changes to the environment that can then affect insects. Um, you know, the, these are uh, a list of the, of the major uh, causes um, that he reports, things like global warming, droughts, pollution, agricultural intensification. 
Um, and when I read this paper and I looked at, you know, here, here are all these different mechanisms that can potentially contribute to insect decline. And there were a couple of them that really jumped out to me. So things like inter, uh, disrupting interactions between organisms, uh, introduced and non-native species, uh, urbanization and deforestation. Those are all mechanisms that potentially can be influenced by the plant communities um, that we cultivate. And so I would argue that one of the biggest ways that we can make a difference to reverse these insect declines is to start rethinking what our relationship is with our, um, with our plant communities that we manage and start con um, considering biodiversity conservation as a major priority in our decision making. And so, you know, these small planting decisions can really transform uh, land and our properties. Uh, things like what sort of trees are left behind when uh, a, a neighborhood is developed, uh, what sort of trees are planted in their place, uh, our designer gardens, how many times we mow. Each one of those seemingly small decisions has had the additive effect of completely transforming the plant communities that have survived to occupy the present day. And this is in really um, obviously novel communities like our urban and our suburban areas, but also in our regenerating forests as well. We have tree communities that are completely different from the historical tree communities from a century ago. And so one of the ways that I've really focused a lot of my research is to think about informed plant selection and how that fits into your management toolkit. Because we all know that as foresters or even as just private landowners, there's a lot of decisions that go into how we garden or what trees that we plant, um, what, what it looks like, what sort of soil, sun and moisture requirements a tree has, what's its size and growth rate. And so I hope by the end of this talk that you'll start to consider biodiversity conservation also in that equation um, and think about what sort of questions you might have that will help you uh, conserve biodiversity more efficiently um, and help you uh, choose the right species that'll, that'll then do that. So um, for this talk, I wanna start by speaking to why tree species might matter from the perspective of our pollinating insects. And so, uh, you know, some folks on here may be familiar with the monarch butterfly, uh, which as a caterpillar in its larval form will feed exclusively on milkweed plants. Uh, but what you may not realize, and I actually didn't realize this until uh, I started my own grad work, is that more than 90% of our plant eating insects are specialists to some degree. Um, and the reason for this is that these plant eating insects like caterpillars have adapted over evolutionary time to feed on very particular host plants that they've overcome these uh, nasty defensive chemical compounds that are found in the leaf. Uh, and they also adapt in other ways, such as to the uh, phenology or the timing of that uh, tree, um, such as when it leaves out. Um, but they also can adapt to the morphology or the shape or look of that tree as well. So a really nice example of this is the double tooth prominent, which is a uh, caterpillar that feeds exclusively on elm trees. Um, and you can see that it fits in really nicely with the double tooth shape of elms as well. And so this caterpillar can blend in, it can avoid predators, and then it can grow up to be this beautiful uh, moth. But for most of the time, this caterpillar or this moth is spending most of its life cycle in this caterpillar form, which is arguably the most important part of this, um, this organism's life. Um, but we see this kind of specialization all through the insect community. So uh, entomologists are really convenient. Um, so when they, when they name common names of species for plant eating species, they often name them for the plant that they rely on. Um, so here's just a couple of examples of specialization. So in the juniper hair streak, uh, this beautiful, amazing green butterfly feeds exclusively on juniper trees. Um, and so if you wanna have this beautiful butterfly in your garden, um, you're gonna wanna plant red cedar trees or, or other trees in the juniperus genus. Um, when this caterpillar turns into a butterfly, it'll eventually visit lots of different flowers 
uh, for nectar resources. But again, for most of this species life cycle, um, they're relying on just a, a, a very few number of plants in order to feed. Uh, another example is one of my favorite moths, which is the rosy maple moth. Um, as you are probably not surprised to hear, this moth relies on maple trees. Um, but we also know that specialization can occur, can occur um, not just for the genus of maples, but also for uh, specific species within that genus. So here in Massachusetts, where I'm calling from, uh, this rosy maple moth can use most of the maples that are out there, but they tend to really prefer sugar maple. So we need to make sure that our sugar maple populations are um, stable and um, doing well in order to have healthy populations of this moth. Um, specialization can also occur at a regional level too. So um, for the Eastern tiger swallowtail, which is a big, beautiful butterfly, uh, they're actually considered a plant generalist. So if you look at the number of plants that this uh, butterfly feeds on as a caterpillar, uh, you can see dozens and dozens of different plant uh, genera. Um, but if you look in individual regions, they tend to specialize. So up here in Massachusetts, they feed mostly on cherries from the Prunus genus. If you go down to the Mid-Atlantic, uh, they tend to feed on tulip trees and ashes. Um, so the loss of ash is going to be a big deal for this uh, butterfly in the mid-Atlantic at least. Um, and then if you go even farther down to the southeastern U.S., this butterfly is feeding mostly on sweet bay magnolia. And so even though, you know, hypothetically this, you know, when we look at the total number of plants that this butterfly can use, it might seem like a lot, um, but on a regional level, it's actually um, uh, fairly few. And so, and I want to emphasize that when we think about the butterflies and the moths that are out there, there there's just tons of beautiful, just amazing diversity, um, especially in our moths. Um, and these, uh, these species are really important pollinators in their own right, even, um, even though we don't typically think about them, we might think about bees or butterflies, but our moths are doing a lot of the pollination as well. But in order to support these butterflies and moths, we need to support them in their caterpillar form. And so we need to plant the host plants that these species need. Um, so at this point, you might be thinking, okay, well, that's all well and good, but um, I don't really care about caterpillars. Um, I don't really care about insects. Um, and so I also want to mention why plant identity matters from the perspective of our birds as well. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of evidence out there that planting a tree will help birds. So, you know, having no trees is not as great as having trees that these birds can forage on, especially in urban areas. Um, so it's true that having at least a tree is a good thing to have for birds. But the reason that species identity of trees would actually matter for our birds is, um, um, might be pretty uh, um, intuitive is that our birds eat insects. Um, in fact, uh, our insects are incredibly important for supporting our bird populations. So we have to plant trees and other plants that are supporting those insect populations. Um, of course, I'm an ecologist, so I want to know, you know, just how many there might be. And so I'm um, actually in the United States, over 440 different bird species rely on insects, at least in some point in the annual cycle. Um, and globally, more than 70% of our songbirds eat mostly insects. So more than 50% of their diet are insects. Um, and the reason for this is that insects are highly, highly nutritious um, for growing young. And we see again and again that some insects, like our caterpillars especially, are uh, disproportionately preferred by birds, especially during the breeding season. And the reason for this is that caterpillars are just a wonderful, great food resource, especially when you're growing little baby birds in the nest. Uh, these caterpillars have really high protein, which is important for growing feathers and bones. They have really high calories and a nice power packet of food, so they're really efficient um, to feed on. You don't have to exert as much energy if you can get a nice, fat, juicy caterpillar. Um, and these caterpillars also have really high carotenoids, which is important 
for immune function and also for um, making the beautiful reds and orange colors that we like to see in our cardinals and our orioles. And just to get back to services, um, you know, our birds pro provide a lot of really important services for us as well. So like our insects, they're doing pollination, but they're also doing pest control to make sure our trees and our shrubs stay nice and healthy, seed and nutrient transport. Um, and again, value to people and improving our own well-being. I mean, who doesn't like to go outside in the morning with a cup of tea or coffee and listen to the birds sing? So we don't want to lose our bird populations. Um, and so in this way, our uh, bird populations really rely on our insects. And our insect populations are then built on the foundation of the plant communities that we cultivate. And so um, those seemingly small decisions that I spoke about before, such as what tree species should I plant or where, can have really far reaching implications for the entire food web. And so uh, the rest of my talk is really gonna provide you some, um, some resources to help you make that more informed plant selection so that you can then support biodiversity. Um, so one of the first questions that you might be asking is which tree species should I plant? Um, and if you're interested in just one bird species or just one caterpillar species, it might be pretty obvious which one that you need to rely on. Um, but if you're interested in supporting communities of birds and insects, that's where I come in. That's where I want to help you um, make uh, better decisions to support the most biodiversity as possible. And it turns out that when we look at the number of caterpillar species that a tree supports, there's actually a lot of variation. That plants, some plants support very few caterpillar species and some plants support uh, a lot of different uh, caterpillar species. And so um, when I was working on my PhD, um, I worked with uh, Doug Tallamy, who was my PhD advisor um, and our collaborator, um, Kimberly Shropshire, and we actually did a really deep dive in the literature to try to quantify how many different caterpillar species do, do different plant genera support. And we had to go really deep into historical literature where we would find papers like these where uh, they would describe the different plants that a, a particular caterpillar species was using. And in the end, we had amassed a data set of over 3,600 publications describing the caterpillars that rely on over 2,000 different uh, plant genera from across the United States. And so when we look at the numbers on different plants, we, we get to see really just how drastic this variation is. Um, so these are numbers that I pulled um, for Tennessee. And for your state, you are known to support at least 2,022 different uh, caterpillar species. So these caterpillars that turn into butterflies and moths. Um, and on one side, we have some plants that support most of that caterpillar diversity. So things like oaks that are supporting 440 caterpillars, cherries at 327, birches at 259. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, many plants that support very little caterpillar caterpillar diversity. And so here I have some non-native genera. So things like uh, ginkgo um, supporting six caterpillars, tree of heaven supporting four, silk tree supporting four, um, and then many um, non-native plants that aren't known to support any caterpillar species at, at all. And so these are plants um, that are uh, do not have a natural distribution that includes the United States um, but we've, we've imported them in and introduced them to our ecosystems. And they're not supporting the same number of caterpillars as many of our native species. Um, a lot of my work has kind of compared the differences between native and non-native plants. I'm not gonna get into too much of that detail here. Um, so if you have any questions about that, feel free to ask them at the end. Um, but I want to emphasize um, that this variation is not exclusive to native and non-native species. We also see big differences just in our native plant genera. So here are some other uh, Tennessee plants that are supporting very little caterpillar diversity. So sweet gum at 34, 
tulip tree at 19, black gum at 34. Uh, so these are supporting more than these non-native plants like ginkgo, uh, but not that much more and not supporting quite as much as our oaks and our cherries. And so it turns out that if you look across the entire United States, we see the same skewed relationship in all of the 25 states that we looked at where most of the plants that occur within a state are supporting very little of the caterpillar diversity. And there's a few power players uh, like our oaks and our cherries that are supporting most of that diversity. Um, and it didn't matter whether you were in Tennessee or Massachusetts or California or Texas, or whether you had 3000 plants in your uh, local ecosystem or 2000 plants. Um, we were seeing the same skewed distribution. And so when we, when we looked at these distributions, we kept kind of seeing the same identities come up again and again. So I keep saying oaks, right, uh, or cherries. Um, and so we were really curious if we could then identify which one of these plants uh, would be most important for supporting caterpillar diversity across the United States. And so we used what we call a network approach to ask this question. Um, and so a network is kind of just like a social network. It's connections of interactions between organisms. And so we take the caterpillars that we have and all the plants that they are known to use, and we make these kind of um, interaction diagrams between that connects the, the caterpillar community to the plant community so that we can then identify how important each one of these plant genera are. And so we can ask questions like, um, which plants are most important for supporting richness of species? So we can count up how many different caterpillar species does one plant support? We can also ask questions about sensitivity. So we can say, you know, how many caterpillar species are known to rely on only one plant? So that if we got rid of that plant, we would then lose that caterpillar species. And we call that uh, uh, sensitivity. So an extinction sensitivity or a network sensitivity. And then the third criteria that we were interested in was something called network stability. Um, and without getting into the fancy math of that, it basically uh, looks at the entire network and says, how stable is this food web? And then if you got rid of a plant like an oak, how does that change that network stability? How does that change um, how sensitive um, or rather how stable that network would be to uh, disturbances in that food web? And so we then took all three of those different metrics, the richness, the sensitivity and the stability so that we could identify what we call a keystone plant. And if you're not familiar um, with a keystone plant or a keystone species, it basically means uh, species that are unique components of food webs that are essential for the participation of other organisms in that food web because they have a disproportionate effect on whether those other populations can survive. And we use keystone uh, like, like the um, architectural um, shape where if we were to take that keystone out, the entire uh, structure would collapse. So in the same way, a keystone species, if you took that species out, you would expect that the food web would then collapse. And so when we calculate these different things, um, you know, this, this is a graph of uh, just percent caterpillar species that are supported, so our network richness. Uh, we saw that, again, um, across the entire un United States, there was uh, very big differences in the number of species that were supported, um, where oaks were supporting, on average, more than 20% of the local caterpillar uh, diversity. Uh, whereas most of the plant genera that are out there are supporting less than 1% of the caterpillars um, that, are, that, are, that are out there. Um, and so it was very clear that things like oaks and willows and cherries and birches were supporting much of that caterpillar diversity. And in turn, they were also supporting most of the, of the most sensitive species as well, the ones that we would expect to 
be extirpated if we took that plant away. Um, and when we add up all three of those metrics, we came up with um, that there were about 20 different plant genera that were supporting on, that had a score that was on average higher than most of the other plants in, um, in our analysis. And we conducted this analysis just on woody trees and shrubs because it was very clear that uh, trees and shrubs were supporting most of the caterpillar diversity. And so to reduce computation time, we just took all that herbaceous stuff out, out of there, all those flowers and garden plants, um, and just focused on our trees. Um, and, and again, we see that when we think about all three of these metrics, that oaks and willows and cherries and pines are uh, right up on top. So they're doing most of the work. Um, so, so this was pretty clear, but we wanted to kind of see in, in, if we were to actually put this into practice, would this make a difference? And unfortunately, it'd be really hard to do these kind of experiments across the entire United States and plant trees and then monitor how many caterpillars that they attracted. So we used a simulation approach. And um, before I share with you the results of that simulation, um, just in essence, what we did was we, uh, we created a computer program that selected plants randomly from increasing from zero to 50 plant genera. Um, and then we said, okay, now select whether this is a naive approach with no keystone plants or whether you have increasing keystone plants from zero to 15 plant genera. Um, and at every iteration of this program, I want you to calculate how many caterpillar species that you're supporting. And so we sent the program off to just keep doing this 10,000 times and calculating, okay, we're gonna pull 20 plants. How many caterpillars do we, um, do we support? Uh, okay, we're gonna pull 20 plants, but 10 of them are keystone species. Now, how many caterpillars do, that, uh, do we support? And so here on the Y axis is number of keystone plants increasing. And on the X axis is the number of just total plants increasing. Um, and what we found is that uh, for woody plants, so again, our trees and our shrubs, including keystone species in your decision-making makes your restoration for caterpillars more um, efficient. And so, um, if you're supported, if you planted 50 different plant genera, you're going to support about 55% of um, the interactions that are possible in your in your local ecosystem. Um, but if you if you plant just 15 of the keystone plant genera, you're going to support almost the same amount. So you'll support about on average 60% of the interaction diversity. Um, so if you have limitations on how, how many plant species or, or genera that you're able to uh, include in a restoration project, you're going to get more bang for your buck with fewer types of plants if you're including those keystone plants. Um, but for our, again, for our herbaceous plants, which um, are very diverse, um, but support uh, fewer caterpillars overall on an individual plant basis, we see that including keystone plants can make uh, your restoration more effective. Um, so here in this situation, if you're planting 50 herbaceous plant, uh, 50 herbaceous plant genera, you're, you're only going to on average support 9% of the interaction diversity that's out there. But if you switch to an informed decision making where you're planting uh, 15 keystone plants, now on average, you're supporting about 28% of the available interaction diversity. Um, so it's, it's still quite low relative to the woody plants, but it makes almost a threefold difference in how much interaction diversity that you're able to support. Um, all of these results that I'm talking about right now have been based though on um, historical records in the literature. And all those records are, is just a scientist going out and saying, okay, here's an oak tree. I found this caterpillar on it once. 
And so we wanted to make sure that the results that we were seeing in the um, using the, the host plant literature were actually playing out if we went out and counted caterpillars in the field as well. And so we used a data set from Pennsylvania um, where we did that, where we went out and we did lots and lots of searches on different plants to count how many caterpillars and how many different species that we were finding. And what we found is that the results that we found in the field um, were also playing out um, or were, were very similar and mirrored the same results that we saw from the host plant literature. And so what this tells us us is two things. One, that the host plant literature can be a really great resource for you to make those decisions without going out and doing field sampling. Um, and the other thing is that our, um, our results just looking at interactions um, is comparable to the same results we get when we include abundance. So the number of caterpillars and the number of different species. Um, we were seeing the same results regardless of which approach that we use. And so uh, this approach of using uh, network methods can be a really great way to um, identify keystone plants or even just keystone species of any organism um, that can be disproportionately important for restoration and management efforts. Of course, all of this work has only been focused on plants and caterpillars. And although we know that caterpillars are really important for birds, we haven't quite looked to see if these keystone plants are also keystone plants for birds, um, which is where my research is basically going next. And so um, I'm just gonna end this section just with like a, a, a really great comic that uh, a colleague of mine made. Um, and, and kind of the take home messages of this paper is that if you wanna, um, pri if you're prioritizing biodiversity conservation in your tree planting efforts, you want to also prioritize these native plants that will maximize your ability to restore uh, caterpillar communities. Um, and that just 14% of the plants that are out there in your local ecosystems are supporting more than 90% of those caterpillars that are out there. Um, and that these oaks and willows and cherries and pines and poplars, um, if you have no other information at your disposal, prioritizing some of these trees in your landscaping um, can be a really great decision. Um, <clears throat> so the next thing I wanna talk about here real quick is uh, what about native cultivars? Um, and so if we think about what sort of plants are available for us to purchase, a lot of times if you go to a local nursery or um, a breeding um, organization, um, they don't have necessarily uh, species that are the genetic population of the lo local ecosystem. A lot of times they can be what we call nativars or native cultivars. Um, and what a native cultivar really is, is a native plant that was bred to express certain desirable traits. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that we as people care about. So we care about like pretty fall colors and like variegation and red and purple leaves. These are all traits that we find very appealing. Um, but we can also change things like growth habit. We can make things a dwarf variety um, or um, we can uh, change just the shape of the leaf so that it looks slightly different. Um, we also are cultivating plants for disease resistance. So we see that a lot in our elms. You can get lots of cultivars that are, are derived from Native American elm, but um, they are from populations that are resistant to Dutch elm disease. Um, and then another trait that it can be pretty popular is uh, enhanced fruiting, both because that looks really nice, uh, but also because there is, there is interest in supporting uh, resources for wildlife. So maybe we wanna plant a winter berry that's been bred to support, to produce lots and lots of fruit during the winter season. And so there's been a lot of questions about whether if we're if we're um, selecting for these different traits, does that actually matter from a biodiversity perspective? Because a lot of our work has occurred in natural ecosystems with native genotypes. Um, and so another another project that Doug and I worked on was to kind of test this again from the caterpillar perspective. 
Um, and what we found was that um, most of the traits didn't actually matter. When we, when we look at the abundance and the diversity of caterpillars that are found on different trees of different traits and then compared them to their wild type tree, um, we see that things like fall color and leaf variegation and change of growth habit uh, all of these different traits didn't make a very significant effect on the um, on the caterpillars and other insect herbivores that were found on these trees. And so the uh, the only trait that had a negative effect, a consistent negative effect on these plant eating insects, uh, were if we change the um, the leaf color to be red, blue, or purple. And so when we, when we look at cultivars like this Eastern red bud that um, should be a green leaf full of chlorophyll and we change it to a red leaf, uh, we see fewer insects and fewer insect species are using that tree. And it actually makes a lot of sense because when we select for those red leaves, uh, we also are selecting for those leaves to express lots of those chemical compounds that make that red color, which are then just deterring insects from eating them. Um, which, you know, you might think, oh, well, that's great. We don't want pests on our, on our trees. But the problem is that that's, um, that means that lots, it's not just one or two insects that are deterred from feeding on it. It's all of them that can use that plant. And that's going to have implications for the rest of the food web. So if you have to make a decision on uh, planting a cultivar or not, um, it's best to support to, to plant the wild genotypes. Uh, but if you have to choose something that has a trait, in most cases, it's probably not going to make a lot of difference. I do want to emphasize, though, that this kind of research comparing cultivars to the native uh, genotypes is kind of in its infancy. And there's a lot more work that we need to do uh, to make sure that the plants that we're planting um, are, are still supporting the same diversity, even if we're reducing genetic diversity in uh, the plant community as well. Um, so there's a lot more work to be done, but at least off, you know, from this first preliminary research, we can say that there's only one trait that you should really avoid. Um, another question that you might be asking is what about non-native congeners? And so these are plants that are in the same genera that I've spoken about, like oaks and cherries and birches, there's a lot of non-native species that have been introduced. And I, I actually just read a paper or an article in Washington Post the other day where uh, a, a researcher from, um, uh, I, I forget what university that they were from, but they said, it doesn't actually make a difference. As long as you plant uh, a species that's related to our native plants, then you should be fine. It shouldn't affect the insects at all. And I have to emphasize to you that that is absolutely not true. And we have lots and lots of evidence that the non-native species that are related to our native species are not serving the same ecological function as those native plants. Um, and so, so these non-native congeners are things like Norway maple, Japanese cherry, lace bark elm. These are all related to our native plants. But when we make direct comparisons of the insect communities that are found on the native and the non-native plants, we see that these congeners are supporting 40% fewer caterpillars, uh, caterpillar abundance. Um, and 50% fewer species. And we also see that they're just different in a lot of ways, such as their timing of when they leaf out. Um, and so they're really not uh, supporting the same insect communities compared to the native species. So if you have a choice um, and you wanna prioritize these keystone plants, you still wanna go for the actual species that are native to your local ecosystem. Um, and on a side note, I have a student that's working on this question right now, um, doing some independent work. And um, I just wanted to share some really preliminary results because I love results where you don't even need statistics. You just look, <laughs> you just look at it and you can see these clear differences. And so what he's doing is he's raising these Promethea moth caterpillars on native prunus species uh, that are native to Massachusetts and on introduced prunus species, so things like Kwanzaa cherry and weeping cherry. 
um, and uh, Korean cherry. And we see huge differences in the number of caterpillar species that are surviving even af after just a two week period where almost 75% of the caterpillars are surviving when they feed on native prunus. But if you uh, force them to only feed on non-native uh, prunus, we have on average about only 10% of them are surviving. Um, this is an ongoing project. We have um, some more work that we're doing, but I just think that this is some really interesting uh, results that we're seeing so far. And so the last thing I want to talk about is uh, from the perspective of our birds and what sort of trees are preferred by them as well. And so um, I'm just going to skip through this really quickly because I, I'm going a little over. Um, but to answer this question, we basically just let the chickadees tell us what trees that they like. And so um, we use the technique called color banding where we actually uh, capture these birds so that we can then identify them in the field. And then we follow them around to see what trees that they were choosing. Um, and we're able to make these really nice maps like this where we can see in these dark blue colors where these birds are spending most of their time. Um, but you can see that there's a lot of plants that are in this neighborhood uh, that, th uh, that these birds um, were avoiding in their foraging. Um, and so what we found with these birds is that, um, first of all, they overwhelmingly were preferring uh, feeding on native tree species. Um, and they almost completely avoided any non-native trees in the landscape, whether they were uh, non-native um, genera or non-native species. So again, when we see comparisons between things like red maple and Norway maple, we see big differences in how much these birds are preferring to forage in them relative to, to the landscape. Um, but what I found, thought was really cool about these particular results is that when we look um, at the number of caterpillar species that different plants are supporting, again, from the host plant literature that I spoke about before, we see this really nice linear relationship in native trees, where the more caterpillar species that a tree supports, the more that these chickadees are going to prefer foraging them in the landscape relative to their availability. Um, and then we see uh, for non-native species that this relationship is much weaker, um, indicating that they're really just not reliable. Um, but what I think is so cool is that we can then use these numbers as a quantitative metric that we can use, again, as I was saying before, so that we can prioritize plants that support caterpillar diversity. But now we have some evidence that that can also support bird foraging as well. So if you're interested in conserving birds or, uh, or conserving insect populations, you want to really prioritize uh, these plants that are supporting most of the caterpillars in your local ecosystem because that's going to provide more foraging opportunities for our insectivorous birds. Um, and if you want to uh, find that information, uh, we're working on making this available for you. Um, it's still a work in progress. Um, we actually have on the National Wildlife Federation Native Plant Finder website, you can get uh, numbers of caterpillars for different plants. You can look up plants for your zip code and how many caterpillars that they support um, so that you can then use that in your decision making. But uh, this website is still in progress. This is something that we're working on. Um, if you're interested in using some of this data, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and one of the other things that um, I'm working on uh, with the Forest Service, so you may already be familiar with uh, iTree, which is a tool that you can use uh, to uh, where you can plug in plant data from your um, from your area uh, or what land that you're managing, and you can get information uh, about the ecosystem services uh, that that tree su um, supplies, such as how much carbon is it storing, or or how much is that tree worth. And uh, we're working on trying to um, incorporate more of these sort of wildlife and biodiversity um, metrics as well into this iTree program. So that's also a work in progress. But in the meantime, I encourage you to check that out. Um, and then the last thing I just want to speak about is, uh, you know, the only bird that I talked about was these chickadees that I did my research on. But the same trees that these chickadees were foraging on were also covered with migratory birds during spring migration. 
And so while we were going around and following these chickadees around, we documented more than 50 different species of migratory birds that were using urban areas um, while they're making their migratory journeys up north and more than 20 different species of warbler and numerous species of conservation concern. And so these are all species that don't necessarily breed in urban areas or in residential yards, but are using them to get food in a really important period of the annual cycle during migration. Um, and so uh, it suggests that many of these plant species that we're saying are important for caterpillars and that our chickadees are preferring um, are also probably pretty critically important for our migratory species of conservation concern as well. And so uh, this is some of my work that um, I'm doing right now in uh, New England, um, where we're actually looking at whether, oops, whether there's keystone plants for our migratory bird community and to especially look at oaks and see if managing for oak trees is a really important feature that can improve habitat quality for migratory birds. Uh, so with that, um, just some take home messages for you. Thanks uh, for listening. I, what I want you to take home from this today is that um, foremost, our plant eating insects are adapted to feed on specific host plants and that the plants that you choose are gonna have a really strong effect on which caterpillar uh, diversity is gonna be able to use that land. Um, we also have some evidence that landscaping with native plants and especially keystone species can help make insect biodiversity conservation more efficient and more effective. And also I ended with some evidence that planting trees for caterpillars can also help our insectivorous birds too. And so uh, if you prioritize these plants that are supporting the most caterpillar species, you have a better chance at supporting local food webs um, and in supporting the pollinators and the songbirds that depend on these plants for survival. Um, so with that, uh, I will take any questions that you have. I'm sorry I went a little bit over, but I appreciate all your attention today. Thank you so much. Okay, if anyone has questions, feel free to go ahead and drop them in chat box. Hey, Christy, while we're waiting, uh, uh, we have a diverse audience here from homeowners to tree board members to municipal employees foresters and just it goes down the, mm. the list and uh, uh, one of the points i'm getting from desiree is that regardless of our scope of influence we can make a difference uh, and i was really intrigued by the uh, i forgot the terminology but she's developing that toolkit to better analyze and prescribe to help people prescribe what to plant. My question is, uh, is having a percentage of your plants in native trees a valid goal? For example, should we look for 70% of our landscape as a target in native plants? Sure, so yeah, so that's uh, a, bun a bunch of my other work has sort of looked at these thresholds of how much native plants are, do we need to support um, our local bird populations. And so uh, this other work that I've done has, um, has found that 70% is pretty much the cutoff where if you are supporting, if you, if you have more than 70% of your plant biomass is non-native, uh, you our insectivorous bird populations have almost an, um, very little chance to have a sustainable population. And that's because they're producing fewer young, uh, they're, they're laying fewer eggs, those young are not surviving, and those birds are not choosing those areas to breed. Um, but if you can get your landscape to have less than 70%, um, uh, or sorry, if you can get your landscape to have more than 70% native plants, uh, then the birds have at least some chance of contributing to the local population. Um, and, I, and I didn't speak about that work here today, um, but that paper is available on my website if you want to read it. Um, and it does give you, it does give some uh, uh, goal for you to strive for. And what's been really encouraging is that a lot of 
areas have then taken up that as a call to action. So uh, different neighborhoods have actually focused, uh, actually the neighborhood up here in Massachusetts has incorporated that into their street tree plan. Um, and they actually went for 80%. So in that case, they, they are requiring that more than 80% of their plants be native species because they wanna support uh, their local bird and pollinator uh, populations. Thanks, Desiree. We have a lot of really good questions in the chat. Okay. So uh, is, there an, is there a risk in overusing keystone plants because we still have to take care of the insects that don't use those keystone plants? Sure, and that's an incredibly valid point. So if you're really interested in particular species of sensitive butterflies or moths, um, you're gonna wanna plant what they need. And so if they're not using these keystone plants, um, then only planting, you know, oaks and cherries is not going to cut it. And that's why, you know, in this paper, we emphasize that uh, prioritizing diversity is still important. Like we, we still want to have diverse uh, plant communities because they're going to be more resilient to change, more resilient to disturbance. Um, we can't just plant oak trees because then we're only going to su um, support the things that will use those oak trees. Um, but if we prioritize species diversity and we include keystone plants, um, we're going to have a higher probability of having a better kind of bang for your buck. Um, so every person is going to have their own situation, but in a typical householder that is managing plants on their property or, you know, planting street trees, uh, we probably are going to have a much better luck at supporting more biodiversity and more stable ecosystems by planting keystone plants, especially because some of those uh, more sensitive species are also gonna require more sensitive habitats that our urban and suburban areas just aren't gonna cut it. So it, it, it requires thinking about what your priorities are as well. Great, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, it looks like the sawtooth oak is not a native oak. I think your research shows that this tree would not support wildlife as well as a native oak. Is that correct? Yes, so that is correct. And we did lots of sampling on sawtooth oak in the Washington, D.C. area where I did my um, PhD work. And, you know, sawtooth oak has more caterpillars and other insects on it compared to ginkgo. Like, that's true. Um, but when we compare it to native oaks, which is a better comparison, it supports much less. Um, and it's also invasive. Um, and so it can also homogenize plant communities as well. Um, and so there's multiple reasons to avoid these non-native congeners um, in our landscaping. Okay, are there any long-term effects of highlighting Lepidoptera in tree selection? Or other labs or researchers highlighting other insect orders to generate a well-rounded tree selection approach? I'm wondering if that matters or if so far we're underneath ideal insect populations that doing that do harm through artificial selection isn't a concern at this point. Um, so the, the insects that are, that are going to be most tied to plant community decisions are the plant eating insects. And so I, I do a lot of my work on caterpillars because they're easy to, or not easy, but <laughs> I like studying them. Um, but there's lots of other plant eating insects that are out there, uh, such as um, leaf hoppers, um, uh, beetles, um, some flies can also have flower preferences. There are a lot of insects that rely on plants. And we're using caterpillars as kind of a model, but I would suspect that these kind of skewed relationships also occur in, um, in other taxa as well, just in different ways. So for example, uh, in bees, we see, if we look at specialist bees that rely on particular plants for pollen, um, they can't go to every plant out there. They can only go to certain ones. We, uh, this hasn't been quantified, but you can see these skewed relationships where there's some uh, flowers like sunflower and, um, and, uh, and asters that support most of the pollen specialist bees. And so, um, you know, in this case, we, we are thinking about caterpillars because they're supporting a lot of the other kind of consumer wildlife like songbirds and, and mammals and fish and all, all kinds of things eat caterpillars. 
Um, but it also is a model for other insects that are out there, both because the trees that support caterpillars likely support all the insects that eat those caterpillars, other insects that eat plants, um, and also because just the general idea of using informed plant selection can be useful for other, for other organisms as well that don't rely on trees like our bees. Thank you. All right, we have a comment. Someone would like to point out that it takes about 94% native plants to just have a 50-50 chance of supporting the chickadee population. So there, so I they are referring to um, to my research, and they're right that when we identified the 70% as the cutoff. Uh, that was the point where there was no chance at all of these chickadees supporting a local population. Um, and they're, they're absolutely right that um, where the mean popular, or where the chickadees um, on average were supporting, were, were able to support a local population was at less than 10%. Um, and, um, you know, that's true. These are but we were what we were looking for was really a cutoff to help people. And so we say in that paper too that if we want to have a better chance, you have to aim lower. If you want to support more sensitive species than chickadees, which are arguably very urban adapted, you're going to have to aim lower as well. So it is just a cutoff. But you know, my my perspective from sharing this information with the public is that uh People are really hungry for information that's quantitative, that'll help them make them, their decision. Instead of just going out and saying, plant native plants, now we're, we're trying to help you have goals to strive for as well. But, th but thank you for that comment. Okay, and our last question, at least for now, mm -hmm. which oaks are more important than others? I.e. are uh, white, white oak versus willow oak, there are, there are many species of oaks. Yes, so thank you for that question. Um, so I have that same question as well. <laughs> the problem <laughs> is, is we don't have uh, the level of detail, uh, at least at a continental scale to answer that question. At a local scale, we can see anecdotally that some oaks support more caterpillars than others. So I would say from my own observations, uh, you know, white oaks, um, support more, um, you know, including Quercus alba, but also the others that are in the white oak group, um, support more caterpillars th than the red oak group. Um, but uh, we need more information to be able to ask that question explicitly. So I can't say that for certain just yet. The other thing to keep in mind too, is that, um, you know, when we, when we plant street trees, often those genotypes are not actually the genotypes that you would find in the forest just because the plant breeder has gotten their, their stock from a completely different state. Um, and right now we don't have, we don't have any uh, research that um, to, to, to let us know whether those non-native genotypes are different from the native genotypes well, which is getting really in the weeds here. <laughs> but at, at, with the information that we have right now, without getting into that nuance, if you aim for a native oak, you're gonna do pretty well. Um, and if you wanna get deeper down in those weeds, you can, you, uh, you can help collect more data. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great broad goal for everyone. Yeah. yeah. And what's the best resource you recommend for identifying specific kinds of oaks? Oh, sure. So, um, so I'm not sure about particularly for Tennessee, but there's a lot of good um, websites. So I use the Go Botany website that has um, great resources for identifying plants. Um, the another website that is really fun to use is the iNaturalist website, which, uh, you know, you got, it'll, it'll help you crowdsource information about you take a picture of a plant, you upload it, and then experts and, and naturalists from all over the country will help you identify it. And, you know, that's been, that's not what I use to identify plants. I use field guides, but um, it's a really great way to introduce you to uh, and help you identify things that are in your backyard, but not just plants, uh, insects and birds and any, any kind of biodiversity that you find in your backyard, you can upload to this website. Um, and it's a really fun way to, um, to get to know who you're living with. 
Awesome, thank you. And I'll, I'll add to that, I believe our extension, oh yeah, okay, someone just, someone just replied, yeah, UT Extension has identifying oak trees native to Tennessee. So that's a publication that, um, that everyone can look for. It, it's available through um, our website or extension.tennessee.edu. Okay, Neil, I believe that those cover okay, all the questions. We, so if you wanna uh, end us. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. I almost hate to see this presentation end to be frank with you. Uh, I wrote down four pages of notes <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna have to look at the archive uh, YouTube again later, Desiree, to <laughs> catch what I missed. But I, I will take this opportunity, not just to thank you, but to make a suggestion, because I feel like I have an opportunity, that the research you're doing and your colleagues in the Northeast, I think has, it's obvious it has application nationwide and actually worldwide. And I, I would hope that you have some colleagues across the country where y'all can network and communicate and, and perhaps do some research that's more relevant to regions of the country so that we really get a good understanding of this network, this food web network and the plant ecosystem and the decisions we make in urban and community forestry to sustain that. But I just hope that you have some influence to get some other researchers involved on this uh, and to continue uh, your very important research. Thanks, Neil. Yeah, I, I'm fully support that too. If anybody ha ever has any questions and they want to get their own work started or, or, you know, feel free to reach out to me anytime. All right. Well, with that, we're going to conclude and adjourn our webinar. Thank you again, Desiree. And we're going to be reading more about your achievements in the future. Thank you. Have a good one. <laughs>